I was born and raised in India, so I went to, uh, to school in India, I went to college in India, and I came to the U.S. to get my MBA. And when I came to get my MBA, my plans were to get my MBA and either go back to India to work in my family business or to go work at a bank or a consulting firm. But God has this way of changing your plans. I still remember that in the last semester of my MBA, I was uh, I had to make some money. So I was a TA for a class. So I, you know, I showed up in my class expecting to just be a TA for 15 weeks and earn my money. And I walked into that room and I knew that this was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I wanted to be a teacher. And that's how I still describe myself. I'm a teacher first. I'm not a valuation guru. I'm not an academic. I'm not a professor. I'm a teacher. And I knew that that was what I was meant to do. So people talk about how moments change your life. That one moment of walking into the classroom changed the course of my life. So once I discovered that that's what I was meant to do, I went on to get my PhD, which is what you need to teach at a university in the U.S., and I became a teacher. I became a teacher who was called a professor, was given this glory of being a professor, but I was really a teacher. I started uh, teaching in 1984 at the University of California in Berkeley, and then I came to NYU, New York University, in 1986, and I've been here ever since. So I've spent the bulk of my life teaching. So I teach corporate finance and valuation because I find finance fascinating for two reasons. One is it's always changing. There's never a settled point. Everything is in change. And the second is it's a fairly unique combination of numbers and storytelling, which I find appealing. A lot of people, when they think about finance, think about numbers. That's accounting. Accounting is all numbers. Finance is a combination of storytelling and numbers that appeals to me, that works to my strengths. So I'm a teacher first and a finance person next, but they're both passions of mine. I'm excited about both of those disciplines. I think it's just there are things you're meant to do in life that you know, and, and I think this happens. Everybody's life, there's a moment when you realize you're doing something that this was what you were meant to do. And I think we sometimes miss those moments because those are moments, and I think of them as divine interventions, where essentially you're told, hey, this is what you're meant to do with the rest of your life. And most of us just let it slide by. I was just lucky enough that I was aware that when that moment happened, I was ready. I can't even describe the moment. It's just that you know you're completely comfortable, that this was the environment you were put in, this was what your strength was, and they all come together in that moment. The drivers of value have always been the same from the Middle Ages to today. The drivers of value of a company are three, cash flows, growth, and risk. You want high cash flows, you want to grow a lot, and you want to do it with low risk. So whatever models you use ultimately try to convert those three fundamentals into numbers you can convert into value. Now once you decide to run a business, you want to run the most valuable business. Now a lot of people when they think about value tend to think about profits. They think about most valuable business must mean you make the most profits. Two things to remember. First is profits are accounting numbers. Accounting profits might not be the same as cash flows. The second is profits are in a year, in a time period, whereas values over time. So the reason I differentiate between the two is value maximization doesn't mean maximizing profits today. It might actually mean losing money today to create value in the future. It's a much more long-term, much more holistic, much more all-encompassing number than looking at the profit. So when I think about value, I think about everything that goes into a business. And maximizing value basically means making those decisions that make your business the most valuable business you can over time. The paths that increase value, the paths that increase your cash flows, increase your growth and reduce risk. So if you go back to the fundamentals, any path to value has to show up in one of those three places. That said, though, when you, when you think about cash flows, cash flows are a function of how much you make on your existing investments and how much you put back into the business to create growth. So here's where we need to talk about growth. When we think about growth, we think of it as a good thing. So we think of growth companies as good things and shrinking companies as bad companies. That is not necessarily true because growth is a double-edged sword. The good side of growth is when you have growth, you increase your earnings, you increase your cash flows over time. The bad side of growth is you have to put money back into your business to grow. The reason I'm saying that is you can grow and add value, which is good. You can grow and do nothing for value, and you can grow and actually destroy value. About a, I would, my estimate is about half of companies out there destroy value while they grow. 
They destroy value because what they need to put into their business to grow actually exceeds what they get out of the business and grow. So when you think about value enhancement, sometimes for some companies, value enhancement might mean making a company a smaller company. That goes against everything we're taught as human beings. We want to grow. We want to be optimistic. But if you're a company in a bad business or you're in an aging company, the best thing you could probably do as a company is to become a smaller company, is to actually go for less growth, actually shrink your company, because that might in fact be the best thing to, thing to do if you're at that stage in your life cycle. The simplest tool I can offer for separating good value from bad value is to look at two numbers. One is called the return on capital. It's what you make on your investments, and the other is the cost to capital, what it costs you to raise money to fund these investments. And here's the rule. If your return on capital, what you make on your investments, exceeds your cost of capital, you're creating value. If your return on capital is less than your cost of capital, you're destroying value. The reason I like those metrics is I actually compute those metrics for all 41,000 publicly traded companies in the world at the start of every year. Start of this year, two-thirds of all companies around the world, two out of three companies, actually earn a return on capital less than their cost of capital. That's a scary number. Because that means two out of three companies are actually destroying value as they grow. Now, some of them might have good excuses. You could be a commodity company and you had a bad year. You could be a young growth company and you're not starting to make money yet. So I'm going to cut you some slack if you're a growth company. Because you might be earning less than your cost of capital today, but if you can convince me that you have the pieces in place to earn a much higher return on capital in the future, you could still be creating value from growth. But to me, knowing what those two numbers are for your company is a key step in running your company well. What are you making on your investments? What does it cost you to fund these investments? I think we first need to shift the focus away from models to the people using the models. 20 years ago, when I wrote that book on the dark side of valuation, my problem was not with the models, but with the people using those models. So here's what happens. If I give you a good model and you like it, you start to get very attached to it. And especially in today's day and age, we have Excel spreadsheets and you have computers, you get attached to the model, you get to do the model the same way over and over again. So you get more and more comfortable with the way you use the model. And the problem is if I throw you a different kind of company and you go back to the old model that you used and you do things the way you've always done them, the, it's not that the model's not working, it's you misusing the model. And that's what I think tends to happen when you have change. When I wrote the book, my first edition of The Dark Side of Valuation, I was writing about dot-com companies, young companies. Companies that traditional analysts had never seen before in public markets because those were companies that stayed private, that venture capitalists used to invest in, that never showed up in the market till they were more mature. So traditional analysts, when they tried to value young technology companies, took their existing models and they tried to make them work with these young companies using the tools that they brought to old-time companies. The models didn't fail they failed. The reason I updated the book 10 years later is I discovered that it's not just young companies where people have trouble, it's whenever there's uncertainty. 2009, for instance, if you're an analyst valuing a bank, you had lots of models you developed with the old banks that used to work well in the old economy before the crisis. You took those same models and tried to apply them to banks using the same techniques that you used before, they didn't work anymore. Not because the models were bad, but because you were using the wrong inputs, the wrong techniques with those companies. So my point is, let's, we need to build more flexibility with users of models rather than with models. We need people to think outside the box rather than make models plug and chug models, which is what they've become, right? You put a spreadsheet, you enter numbers in, the model spits out a value, say this is great, I have a value. We need to realize that a model is our tool, not the other way around. Models work for us rather than us working for models. And unfortunately, we live in a world where it's so easy to build these complex models that I think models run users rather than users running models. I think the future belongs to change. It could come from established companies, it could come from startups. I think that that's always been the case. The future has always belonged to those entities that, that embrace change. So if you're an established company that can embrace change, I don't see why you, the future doesn't belong to you. So it's not that the startups control the future, it's they're the companies where change is most welcomed. Because if you're a mature company, you're making money already. You don't like change. 
So I think what we need to do is embrace change and make it part of our culture, whether you're an established company or a young company, because the future belongs to those people who embrace change. The problem with, with, with being over-optimistic if you're a startup is you overestimate everything. You overestimate revenues, you overestimate earnings, you overestimate your chance of success, and when you overestimate those numbers, you fail. That's what we call a bubble, right, when you collect. My question is, so what? So what if, you know, but that's the nature of startups, is you've got to be over-optimistic. If you're a realistic entrepreneur, you will never start up a company. I mean, I, I, the question I often ask my students is, would you want to live in a world run by actuaries? Actuaries estimate the properties of everything. They're realistic about things. Actuaries would never start up companies because they would look at the outlook and say, hey, there's a very low chance we're going to actually disrupt this business or start a new business. Let's not start the business at all. So to me, the, the fact that people overestimate their chances of success, are over-optimistic about the future, is a good thing. That's what's allowed human beings to move out of caves into where we are now in cities. That first cave person who left the cave was probably being over-optimistic. His chances of success were probably very low, but he said, I'm going to take my chances. So over time, this is how human beings have advanced. They've been over-optimistic, they overestimated their chances of success, and they've tried to do things that realistically they had a very low chance of succeeding with. But that's what makes us succeed over time. That's what leads to disruption and change. And that to me is a good thing rather than a bad thing. I think that if you look at the modern corporation, let's look at the, let's list all the different groups and their interests, right? First, you have the stockholders. What stockholders want is a higher stock price. They want more. You have managers. What managers want is to make sure that they continue to be managers and get paid a decent income. Then you have employees. What employees want is a higher income and make sure that their jobs are not in jeopardy. Then you have society. And what society wants out of companies is that they create social benefits, that they employ a lot of people, pay them well, provide them health care. So each of these groups has a different interest. And ultimately, if you go out and borrow money, you now have lenders who want to make sure that they're paid interest payments. The very minimum, you have at least five groups with five very different interests. And when you look at the modern corporation, it's managers who make decisions, right? And if managers make decisions, they have to balance these interests. Is this good for stockholders? Is this good for lenders? Is it good for employees? Is it good for society? So I'm not sure you can reconcile those interests. You can try to find a compromise solution, which doesn't make any group terribly worse off, but makes somebody better off. So in a sense, if you're trying to keep all of these groups happy, none of them will be happy. So in a sense, you've got to find a compromise solution that keeps at least one group maximally happy and the other groups not too unhappy. And the way I teach corporate finance, I say, look, the group that you have to keep most happy are the stockholders. But at the same time, you've got to keep the other groups on your side because without employees, without society being on your side, your stockholders will never make more money. So it's, a, it's really a balancing of interest rather than saying, how do I keep, keep all of these groups happy? The first thing we need to do is to not departmentalize companies. And what I mean by that is often in, when, you think about it, when you think about a company, you think about the CFO's job as doing everything related to finance, a marketing person's job to do everything related to marketing. And the reaction that the CFO has is, why do I need to explain to the marketing person why his job or her job affects the value of a company? I think the first thing we need to do is lay out with every group how, what role they have from the lowest person in the totem pole, the guy who does the mail room, all the way up to the CEO, what role they have in how the company creates value. Which means you gotta treat people with respect. Just because a person is jan a janitor or in charge of logistics doesn't mean you can say, oh, you don't have to understand what drives the value of the company, you're too low in the totem pole. I think we need to bring people into the organization and make them recognize how each of them plays a role in creating value in the company. Okay? And I think that, that requires some education on all sides. The finance people need to be educated about marketing and production. The production people need to be educated about marketing and finance. Every group needs to understand what everybody else in the company is doing and have some respect for what they're doing. 
the Renaissance, of course, was, you know, if you look at, if you go to Florence and you look at what the Renaissance people did, what was amazing to me about the Renaissance was the fact that you had people who started off as artists who became scientists and engineers. Leonardo da Vinci, right? He was everything. And so when we talk about a Renaissance man or a Renaissance woman, these are people who are good at multiple things. Who are, and the reason I bring that up is we live in a world of specialization. Starting at the age of 15 or 16, we're told, you've got to become a scientist, you've got to become a number cruncher, you've got to become a literature person. And we all have become so specialized over time that we, and you see this, in fact, when you, when you go to a doctor, right? You don't go to a doctor, you go to a specialist. The specialist takes a look at your ankle. He's an ankle specialist. He doesn't even know about the rest of your body. He tells you what you need to do to fix your ankle but he doesn't care about the rest of your body. You go to a finance person, you no longer go to a general person, you go to somebody who's an expert on options or an expert on stocks. They tell you what to do with that portion of your portfolio, but they forget about the rest of your portfolio. We need people who are big picture people. And that's what, to me, the lesson of the Renaissance was, was you need people who understand not just number crunching, but storytelling, who don't just understand finance, but theater, who don't just understand markets, but history because it's by combining those disciplines that you become a better investor. And I think we need more of those big picture people, but unfortunately we're having fewer and fewer of them because of the way we've constructed our education system and our job system. We're creating a world of specialists where nobody has a big picture of what's going on. When I started in finance 30 years ago, you could afford to live in a country, focus just on that country, and not even think about the rest of the world. So if you're an Indian analyst, all you needed to really understand was India, because most Indian companies got most of their revenues in India, they did their business in India, they paid taxes in India. You didn't care about the U.S. or Brazil. And if you lived in Brazil, all you cared about was Brazil. You cared about the government, you cared about the companies, because most Brazilian companies, again, were inward focused. Those days are over. When you look at a company now, you might live in a country, but your company is a global company. I could be a U.S. analyst, but I look at Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is a U.S. company only in name. It gets 60% of its revenues outside the U.S. Vale is a Brazilian company only in name. It's a global mining company. Tata Consulting Service is an Indian company only in name. So what globalization has wrought is you no longer can afford to be just locally focused, you got to be globally focused. You got to be looking outward to make your best decisions in, inside your country. So whether you're an investor or a company, you need to be aware of what's going on in the rest of the world. You can no longer afford to be in this insulated space. We say, all I care about is my country and who runs my country. Everybody else is connected to you and what's happening in the rest of the world can affect you as an investor. Okay. And if you ask me, if, do we live in a world of abend abundance and scarcity? We live in a world where there's more abundance now than we did 30 years ago. I mean, look at Asia especially, right? I mean, I come from a country of a billion people. I live next door to a country with a billion people plus. For a long time, for almost 300 years of history, these people lived in poverty. What you've seen in the last 30 years is probably the greatest wealth creation in history where India and China have risen from the ashes to become global economies. You've seen this to a lesser extent in Latin America, a lesser extent because the populations are smaller of, of countries rising from where they were. That doesn't mean that we live in an age of abundance for everybody. There have been side costs. Indian farmers have probably been hurt. So the consequence of globalization is the wealth creation has been uneven. The way I see it, people who live in urban environments have gained the most from globalization. So if you live in Sao Paulo, you live in New York, you live in Mumbai, you've gained from globalization. You live in a farm, a small town, you've actually been hurt by globalization because what used to be a protected business 30 years ago is now being globalized. You're facing competition from places you didn't even know competition could come from. So one of the downsides of globalization is there's been abundance, but the abundance has not been evenly spread. That's why you've seen Brexit and you've seen the political shocks to the system over the last few years is the people who've been left out in globalization is saying, what about us? You talk about wealth creation, but all the wealth creation seems to go to those people in the cities who are in financial markets, what about us? And we need to think about how to bring those people into the abundance as well, because they're feeling scarcity while the rest of us are feeling the abundance. Wealth to me is being happy with what you have. If you want what you already have, 
you're already a happy person rather than having what you want. Because I think we live in a world where told, reach for things you know which are out of your reach. And I think that's, that's good in terms of being ambitious, but if you're constantly striving for things that are out of your reach, you can never be wealthy. You, ne you can never be wealthy enough. You could be worth a billion dollars, but you want to be worth five billion. So sometimes you got to say, what do I need? Do I already have what I need? If you already have what you need, you're already a wealthy person. If you get more, you might give it away. You might help your children. But I think we need to take control of our expectations. I think we live in a world where we're told you need a Rolls, you need a bigger house, you need everything has to be bigger and better and, and more expensive. And as long as you're striving for things that are out of your reach, you can never be wealthy. I think some of it is just luck. A lot of it is luck. When you look at why some people are richer than others, I would like to tell you that's because they're more skillful. They do. The reality is 80%, perhaps more, of what happens to you during your lifetime is just being in the right place at the right time. I think there are a lot of lucky people who are rich, and there are a lot of unlucky people who end up being not rich. I'm not saying luck is the only thing, but here's the way I separate people who are rich from people who are not. People who are rich take the luck that is given to them and build on it. I'll give, I'll give you a very simple example. Let's suppose as you're walking through a train station, you see $100 on the ground. You just got lucky, you pick it up, and there are two things you can do for it. One is you can take the $100 to the nearby restaurant and eat the biggest meal you ever had and spend the 100. Or you can take the $100 and say, oh, I found $100 today, I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to invest in a business. The person who took the $100 and invested in a business is going to be more likely to be wealthy than the person who spent the money right away. So here's my advice. During your lifetime, you're going to be lucky. There are going to be times when luck comes to you. And what you do with the luck is going to make the difference between whether you end up being a wealthy person or a not wealthy person. If you can take the luck and build on it, well, you're going to succeed. If you take the wealth, uh, the, the luck that's given to you and you waste it, then you can be lucky and at the end of your life say, I was such an unlucky person, nothing good ever happened to me. Good things happen to everybody. But some people build on those good things, other people waste them away. Let's talk about financial education. I think it's true we live in a world of financial illiteracy where people don't know enough about their own money and where it's invested and it gets them into trouble. That said though, we, sh we don't need to overdo this. We don't need to put everybody through financial boot camp, but there are basics you can do to get yourself on board in terms of financial education. First, learn at least the basics of different markets. What does a stock do? What does a bond do? What, do, what is realistic? How do different asset classes work? Second, be realistic about your expectations. Don't invest to get rich. Invest to build on wealth you created from doing something. So if you're a doctor and you earn an income, that is the basis for your wealth. What investing does is it makes sure that you can preserve and grow that income. So don't overreach. Don't try to do anything. Third, keep, keep learning. There are so many different ways. You can learn online, you can read books, keep learning. Fourth, don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated by the financial experts because they will use buzzwords on you. They will use words you don't understand. They will convince you that you're stupid, that you need to turn your affairs over to them. You might turn your affairs over to them, but you need to know enough about what they do. And much of, those, much of the buzzwords they use actually hide some very basic common sense. Finance fundamentally is common sense. Anybody who's willing to spend some time and a little bit of attention to what's already out there should be able to learn enough finance to be take, able to take care of their own financial affairs. So to me, that's the essence of financial education, is recognize what you have, recognize what you can invest the money in, learn enough about these investments that you can, before you go into them, don't invest in something and then try to find out more about it and don't be greedy. Spend less than you make. That's the first lesson, right? That's the biggest lesson. If you keep spending more than you make, you're never going to get wealthy. Live within your means. Don't, don't, I mean, I, I, I tell my students when they graduate, for a, for a few months at least, live like a student. Because when they graduate, they get a job. What they try to do is they spend up to their job and beyond. Which case, they've set themselves for a lifetime where their income is chasing their expenses for the rest of their lives. Live within your means in terms of look at what you make, spend less than what you make, try to set aside money when you're young. Because the money you set aside when you're young is going to make a lot more return for you over time. People forget the power of compounding. Money you save at the age of 21 or 25 or 30, 
has a huge, huge impact, vastly out of proportion to what you actually say, because you get 25 or 30 years where that money can earn returns. So the earlier you start saving, the better off you are, which means you've got to sometimes economize when you're young. Don't buy that 55-inch TV when you can live with a 20-inch older TV. So that, to me, is the key to building up wealth over time. I think all, every discipline has a human component to it, right? Economics more than any other, because it, economics is not a science. It's a social science, which means you can never take the human out of economics. In fact, one of the biggest, the fastest growing areas of economics is behavioral economics. Over the last 40 years, you've had this incredible surge in behavioral economics, which is really a blowback against economics trying to be a science. For a century, economics tried to become a science by making it about equations and math and numbers and using the setup of a rational investor to make all these conclusions about what people should and should not do. About 40 years ago, people said, well, that doesn't make sense. People don't always behave rationally. They're people. They sometimes make decisions that are irrational because it makes them feel better. The whole area of behavioral economics is to try to combine psychology, which is really the human component, with the economic component to try to come up with this blended view of, hey, what is the best way to make decisions given that it's human beings who are making these decisions, not machines? I think it, it, social networks basically are really the re recognition that as human beings we need the interaction. 300 years ago the way you interacted is you joined a crowd in the public square which is 15, 20, 25 people. Social networks have therefore been with us as long as human beings have been on the earth. What's different is technology has made those online social networks a much bigger space. You can get on Facebook and be with a hundred friends in a minute. So what social networks have created is they've created crowds everywhere. And those crowds have consequence. They've changed the way we get entertainment, right? So when you want to go see a movie, rather than check out what the reviews for the movie are, you throw it out of the crowd. Should I go see the movie? What do you think about it? Rotten Tomatoes has a much bigger impact on movie success now than critic reviews. If rot on Rotten Tomatoes you get a 95% review, people go to see the movie. The way we review products, you go on Amazon, how do you decide what product to buy? You look at the number of stars it has based on what other people tell you about the product. So increasingly we're turning from experts to crowds. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because it means that the power of the experts is now much less than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Last year, in fact, one of the reasons all the experts seem to be wrong and everything is the crowds were getting it right. There's a bad side too. Crowds don't always behave in good ways. You have mobs, right? Basically, you can have a mob rule and that can sometimes... So we have to do this with open eyes. Social media has brought in good things into the marketplace. It's also brought in bad things. It's easy to shame somebody online now. You say something that is off color. 30 years ago, you said it at a restaurant. Three other people heard it. It didn't get out to the world. Now you say something off color on your Twitter feed. Somebody notices it. Next thing you know, you have five million people harassing you saying, hey, take that off the air. How dare you say that? So I think we have to be very careful about the power we've given crowds to decide what we do as society. Because crowds can be sensible. Crowds can also do some senseless things. When you look at, uh, at how social media has changed the way we we interact, it also changed the way companies have to advertise, right? The way you used to advertise as you're a young startup is you'd go onto the newspapers, you'd go onto Google, you'd try to put up ads to get people to come to your business. Today, increasingly, it's word of mouth on social media. In fact, there is this, um, the, there is this outfit that, that's New York-based called L2 that basically measures the social media profile of a company. And increasingly, they're discovering that if companies have low social media profiles, they're not it's affecting their revenues, their income, their cash flows. So especially if you're a young startup, you're very dependent on social media to succeed. You're very dependent on social media if you fail. Hey, there's actually a, a cupcake store right outside you know, NYU, which a few months ago got picked up on Facebook as a place to go. Now there are lines of 300 people every day lining up for that store to get into the store because they've seen it on Facebook. That store is incredibly successful. But that, that can, so crowds, what I said earlier about crowds can also play in here. Crowds can make you very successful. Crowds can also make you collapse overnight. So you got, it's, you're, it's like riding on the back of a tiger. If your success is built on Facebook and Twitter, 
you're riding on the back of a tiger. It's very powerful. It can get you lots of places. But if you're not careful, it can eat you. So you've got to treat it with respect and you've got to be careful how you interact with it because it can make you successful but it can also make you fail. I think increasingly, when you think about the future, with the change you're seeing, the number of choices people have, I think the realization is we're competing for people's time. That's basically it. Users have, people have only so many hours every day. If they're spending it on Facebook, they can't spend it on you. So increasingly, I think creative groups, entities, even big companies are competing for your time because you have so many demands on your time as a consumer. So I think as companies, you increasingly have to think about how much of users' time do I take on? So that's why when I look at the market cap of a company like Apple or Google or Facebook, I'm not surprised they're so high. Because think about how much time of each day you spend on your Apple smartphone or on Facebook or searching for something on Google or going on YouTube. Not surprisingly, those are the companies that have the highest market value. The companies that have dropped the most in value are the companies no longer control as much of your time. You don't spend as much time in your automobile anymore. Or if you're spending time in your automobile, you're listening to something on social media while you're in an automobile. So the traditional old-time companies are taking up less of your time. The newer companies are taking more of your time, and they account for more of your value. So as a creative company, you want to claim people's time. So the more you can do it, the more successful you will be. Well, by traditional business, so if you want to think about the difference between traditional businesses, I think by traditional business we mean the old-time manufacturing business because that's what the last century was all about, right? The automobile business, the steel business. Those businesses are top-down. What I mean by that is you build a factory, you produce cars, you sell it to people, you make money on selling cars. You don't think about the people buying the cars as your they, they might be consumers, but you really are about the factory and the product. Today's companies, if you think about them, and that's a big shift, are companies that are built around users or subscribers or members. You look at Facebook, it's not a particular product they're concerned about. It's how many users do we have and how much time do they spend on our ecosystem. The focus is therefore shifted with these new companies away from products towards users, subscribers, and members. And the way this plays out in my arena, where I do valuation, is rather than think about how many cars you will produce or how many units you will produce, I have to think about how many users you will have and how those users will generate revenues and cash flows. I'm still concerned about cash flows, but the way I think about building up to those cash flows is different with the new companies and those of the old companies. One of the biggest problems we face is accounting as we know it was designed for the old-time manufacturing company. What I mean by that is if you were an automobile company, you bought land, you built a factory, produced cars, accountants knew exactly what to do with you. They took the cost of the factory, they treated it as a capital expenditure, showed it in your balance sheet, and wrote it off over time. The expenses in making the car were treated as operating expenses. So when you looked at the income for an automobile company, it's actually money you made on your cars, looked at the balance sheet, it showed you what they'd invested in to make that money. Let's take a technology company though. Let's take Facebook. Facebook doesn't build factories. It goes after new users. So it's, a, it's equivalent of building a factory is the cost it spends to acquire new users. Unfortunately, though, the accountants don't know what to do with it. It's not like land and building, so they take those expenses and treat them as if they were accounting expenses, operating expenses. What that means is, when you look at the income statement and the balance sheet for Facebook, you're getting a very skewed vision of the company because you're taking their biggest assets, which is building up users, and not treating it like an asset. So the balance sheet doesn't reflect their biggest assets. The income is really not income. It's income after capital expenditures. So what will happen is with technology companies, the earnings will often be understated because it's after these big investments they're making to acquire new users. So if I'm doing a valuation of a technology company, the first thing I need to do is redo the accounting, which takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, and most people are not willing to do it. But if you don't do it, you're going to get a very misleading view of these companies. They will look expensive to you on a price-earnings ratio basis. They will look like they're trading at 80 times earnings, when in fact they might be trading at 20 times earnings. So it requires that we reorient the way we look at financial statements to use them better. When I'm asked what I want on my tombstone, what I want people to remember me by, it's not my books, it's not my writing, because I have no illusions about them. They will fade. Nobody's going to remember a word I wrote 20 years from now, 50 years from now. But 
my legacy as a teacher hopefully will live on because the students I teach will teach other students. It's, it's a legacy that, in a sense, keeps on giving. It's a gift that keeps on giving. So if I want uh, something on my tombstone, it was, he was a teacher. That's all I want. Control what you can, but recognize so many things that happen to you are out of your control. If you try to control the uncontrollable, you're going to make yourself miserable, you're going to stress yourself out, and you're not going to be happy. So just control what you can. Do the best you can with what you can and recognize that a lot of what happens to you is out of your control.